Heavenly Father, we praise you for this day, for giving us good health and safety to come and to be together, that we might commune with you around your word. So I pray that you would open our hearts and our ears and our eyes, that we might receive your word and you would speak through Dr. Tom Boyle and just ask that it, you would be honored and glorified in all that is said and how we live our lives for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, you are friendly. Usually you say good morning and they just dirt me. Come on. <laughs> Anyway, my name is Tom Hoyle with Rival Science Ministries, and for the sake of time, we'll share some more about what we do, and why we do it, where we do it, and how we do it, and that, and that kind of thing at the beginning of the worship service, because we want to go ahead and get started here this morning, and hopefully have some time for some questions and comments from you folks. Speaking of which, what time does the rapture happen? I should have asked. <laughs> what, what time do you call the flood? About, about 10.30. Oh, excellent. We've got time. All right, excellent. All right, thank you. Anyway, we get to be with you for two programs today. During Sunday school, we'll be sharing with you, as you might already know, we've been talking about genes, genesis, and George Washington Carter. And, that's the microphone. and then during the worship that's service, me. folks, we'll be looking at the Word of God. We'll be looking at seven excellent reasons to trust the Bible. Before we begin, we've had a lot of questions about those resources over there. I bring the books and discs for two reasons. Number one, many of them are very hard to get. In fact, some of those are out of print. I'm always on the lookout for out of print books. And then uh, secondly, I buy those books and DVDs in huge quantities, which means I get really good discounts that we like to pass on to you folks. So regarding our Sunday school hour, uh, because of the questions asked, let me go ahead and make some recommendations. An excellent DVD on our subject, it's my favorite, Men of Science, Servant of God, George Washington Carver. I love this DVD. They do play this DVD at the George Washington Carver National Monument in Joplin, Missouri. It has this testimony given by a uniformed forest ranger, which surprised me. And they have color film footage of George Washington Carver speaking. My favorite book on the subject is by a friend of mine, George Washington Carver, His Life and Faith. Of the 11 books I've read about him, this one has the most scripture, the most prayer, and the most divine testimony. Another book I like a lot, in fact, he's on the cover along with Newton and Pasteur, Men of Science, Men of God, has a short chapter on Carver, but the main value of the book, it covers dozens of other very smart people who believed in the Word of God. Many of them were outright Christians. This book is so good, I couldn't put it down in like two cities. And then, folks, my favorite overall family book about the Bible science, Wonders of Creation, has a whole chapter on creation astronomy, one of my favorite subjects. I highly recommend this book. But so much for all that. We need to get started. So we thank you for your invitation. Can we go ahead and have all the lights off, please? We don't need to look at me, just the slides. He is on the ball. Look at that. All right. And then how about, can you turn these off too? I can, yes. That'd be excellent. You should give him a raise. Ooh, I've got the power now. I sound like Elijah. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. All right, great. Okay, folks, the year is 1943, the height, of course, of the Second World War. The U.S. Congress did something phenomenal. Meeting and special session, they set aside the possibility of having a fifth national monument to honor an individual. There were already four of them. They were all honoring American presidents like Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Ulysses S. Grant. They decided it was time to honor a non-president. But instead of honoring Benjamin Franklin or somebody like that, they decided our fifth national monument to honor an individual would be for a shy African-American scientist named George Washington Carver. I kid you not. And folks, guess what? The vote was 100%. How often does Congress vote unanimously on everything? <laughs> and FDR immediately signed the bill into law. Furthermore, January 5th was selected as the official federal day of recognition for George Washington Carver. 
In the congressional record, we read, occasionally there moves across the stage of time a historic figure, a creative leader, a profound thinker, a humble servant, or an inspiring teacher. George Washington Carver was all of these, a man whose life was a source of inspiration to all men, a pillar of hope to his race, a fountain of service to his fellows, a tower of devotion to God. May I share with you folks why I believe George Washington Carver was the most inspirational American ever. I know that's a tall order, but bear with me, okay? Now, Carver's life is very controversial for all kinds of reasons. This program is based upon 11 books I've read about him, dozens of articles, websites, films, etc., and my visits to the four main George Washington Carver museums. There's the one in Austin, Texas. There is the wing of the Henry Ford Museum outside Detroit. By the way, has anybody here been to the Henry Ford Museum? It's, yeah. Don't feel bad. It's the most, it's called the best kept secret in America. <laughs> this is the Smithsonian of the Midwest. They've got stuff the Smithsonian would kill for. I've been there three times. I remember the third time was with my wife. She poo pooed it. I've never heard of it. Can it be that good? She was stunned, folks. You name it, they got it, including a wing about George Washington Carver. An excellent stop would be in Tuskegee, where they have the George Washington Carver Museum on campus. But most of all, most of all, most of all, folks, I was in for an extremely pleasant surprise when I traveled from St. Louis while my wife was recovering from a surgery to Joplin, Missouri, nearby the George Washington Carver National Monument. They built it here because that's where he was a slave. The bad news, folks, is nobody goes there because it's out in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and by the way, there's a wonderful exhibit about George Washington Carver, including a life-size bronze statue of him at the new uh, Bible Museum of the Bible. Has anybody been there yet, by chance? Must see, folks. I know Washington, D.C. is not what it used to be. The Museum of the Bible is bigger than eight Walmarts. It cost half a billion dollars, all privately funded. I decided we had a bunch of airline miles saved up, so I took my wife with me. We were planning on one day there. That was a joke. <laughs> we were there two and a half days. It's a must-see, folks. Anyway, this morning, should we look at the career, character, Christianity, and creationism of a very, very special person and learn some spiritual and practical <coughs> insights, starting with his career. George Washington Carver. America's greatest botanist or plant expert, world's greatest black scientist, world's greatest agricultural chemist. He advanced all sorts of scientific methods, renowned educator, devout Bible teacher, staunch creation scientist, electric personality. <laughs> staunch creation scientist, popular public speaker, prolific author, dedicated philanthropist, Talented concert pianist and award winning artist. Can you say overachiever? <laughs> Time magazine called uh, George Washington Carver the Black Leonardo da Vinci. We start with Carver the scientist. The South's economy at this time was based upon white gold, king cotton. That's a bad thing to major on, folks, because cotton is extremely hard in the soil. George Washington Carver and others said, you've got to start rotating your crops. The South didn't do it. Big mistake. Cotton is very hard in the soil. The soil was depleted. The cotton crop populations were shrinking dramatically. That's when I think God stepped in with a massive invasion from the South. Millions of them came, folks. The boll weevil. The boll weevil is a very strange looking bug. And it only eats one thing. Cotton balls. Millions of cotton crops, folks, were wiped out by the bull weevil. The South had no choice. They had to start rotating their crops. And they did it with Carver's recommendation. Peanuts. Peanuts are terrific for the soil. And bull weevils hate eating peanuts. The bull weevils, die, uh, they died off. Today, the South honors the bull weevil. Indeed, folks, I was surprised. Enterprise Alabama, I looked up and there was a bull weevil on the top of this statue. <laughs> Here we have, by the way, two bull weevils. One of these is smaller than the other. How many say the left one is the smallest? How many say the right one is the smallest? 
who says, I don't know and I don't care. <laughs> the right one is a small, I can see why you're, you're reluctant to make a vote, because folks, in life, it's frequently difficult to know the lesser of two evils. <laughs> but Carver wasn't done. Peanuts are good for the soil. They kill all quibbles. And he found 325 uses for peanuts, including the nougat in the world's best candy ever, Reese's Peanut Butter Cups. <laughs> I got some nodding heads there. How many like Reese's Peanut Butter Cups? Oh, thank <laughs> God. I think this is a good church. Carver was called before Congress. He said, the Bible tells about the God who made the peanut. I asked him to show me what to do with the peanut, and he did. Folks, Here's the catch. George Washington Carver did not invent peanut butter. The one thing he's known for is the one thing he did not do. He did reinvent it by homogenizing it. Before he came along, peanut butter spoiled very quickly. The oil would separate. It would turn massive. Today, all peanut butter is homogenized per his invention, except for Adam's peanut butter. You have to refrigerate that to keep stirring it up, okay? Which is what they had to do in the old days. Peanut butter skyrocketed in popularity because now you can keep it forever. They say, folks, that a million years from now, we might have cockroaches and peanut butter and nothing else. <laughs> Everybody bought peanut butter that was homogenized. I had an old can from the 50s on display at our little mini George Washington Carver exhibit over there. A uh, can from the 50s, and it says homogenized peanut butter. Peanut butter became so popular that moms were buying 30 pound cans of this stuff. The PB&J became the most popular sandwich in the world. Right now, folks, by the time they graduate from school, the average American teenager will have consumed 1,500 PB&J sandwiches. Which brings us to the burning question you've been worried about, you've been losing sleep over. What is the most popular jelly to go with a PB&J sandwich? Great. How many here say great? Okay, how many say strawberry? How many don't know or don't care? <laughs> All right, drum roll, please. The winner for the jelly on the PB and J sandwich, folks, strawberry by forty-five percent. Great, forty percent. Everything else, the fifteen percent uh, peach. My personal favorite with honey. Aren't you glad you came to church today to learn how? <laughs> but Carver stayed very, very busy. He found all kinds of uses for all kinds of other <clears throat> things. He did an enormous service for the South and its economy. He called his laboratory God's Little Workshop. And Carver said, Marvel of marvels, how I wish I had you in God's Little Workshop for a while, how your soul would be thrilled and lifted up. The New York Times said, What other man has done so much for agriculture in the South? Reader's Digest, experts say he's done more than any other living man to rehabilitate agriculture in the South. The New York Journal American, his service to agriculture has been unprecedented. His discoveries have brought untold wealth and solace to the world. But folks, Carver was not only an expert regarding agriculture, not only did he make all kinds of discoveries involving agriculture, he made all kinds of other discoveries because he became an expert in chemistry, botany, zoology, and geology. Albert Einstein declared that George Washington Carver was the second greatest scientist in the world. But Carver said, without God to draw aside the curtain, I would be helpless. One of his favorite verses in fact, it was his favorite verse, period. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. But Carver was not only a great scientist, he was quite the educator. After he finished his graduate school, he could get a job anywhere. Instead, he went to work for a brand new struggling college in the South called Tuskegee. His pay was next to nothing, horrible hardships. He had no facilities, everything had to be done by scratch. Today, of course, Tuskegee is a world-class university. Carver taught there nonstop for 47 years straight. He thought that was where he could do the much, most good. His top salary by the time he died was $1,500 a year, which even back then wasn't very much. Indeed, folks, Henry Ford, he loved George Washington Carver. Even though he's a racist, he loved Carver. And he offered Carver a salary $1 million a year in today's currency. 
Henry Ford said George Washington Carver was the number one scientist alive. Ford said Dr. Carver had the brain of a scientist and the heart of a saint. And again, his Henry Ford Museum, to me, it's a must-see. It should be on your bucket list, folks, with all due respect. And you can't miss the special wing that he built in honor of Carver. He also had a reconstruction of the slave cabin where Carver lived as a little boy. But Henry Ford was not the only person stunned by George Washington Carver. Thomas Albert Edison offered him $100,000 a year to work for him, which again would be a million dollars today. Carver said he was making enough money at Tuskegee. Five different presidents came to visit George Washington Carver. Three of them became good friends, both of the Roosevelts and Calvin Coolidge. FDR said, all mankind are the beneficiaries of his discoveries. The things he achieved in the face of handicaps will for all time afford an inspiring example. Everybody from Gandhi to Stalin begged George Washington Carver to visit their country and help them with their agriculture. Carver would receive numerous awards and decorations. Buildings and streets were named after him. The U.S. Navy named two of its ships after him. Coins, stamps were minted in his honor. We have a sheet of his three cent stamp there on display. He was used to sell war bonds during the Second World War. And Carver would tell people, without vision, there is no hope. Protect your country and your future. We could go on and on, folks, about his career. But you know what? To me, the number one thing that Carver did wasn't what he discovered. It wasn't his career. It was his character. And the example that he can set for all of us, I think. George Washington Carver was born into slavery during the Civil War. He was orphaned in infancy. He suffered from chronic and severe health. He stammered. He had a scarred voice. He endured hard, horrible poverty. He struggled to be educated and faced great resentment from both blacks and whites. By the way, folks, George Washington Carver was not his name. He was simply born George. Because his owner was named Carver, he became known as Carver's George. When he was emancipated, he shrugged and said, I'll just switch it around. He transposed his name to George Carver. A postman, when he was a teenager, said, young man, there are too many George Carvers around. You need to have a middle initial. Carver said his favorite letter was W. So that became his middle initial. Later on, he became famous. Everybody wanted to know what the W stood for. Well, you couldn't tell people it stood for nothing. He was a fan of George Washington. So he shrugged his shoulders and said, well, it stands for Washington. And that's how he got his name. But folks, you know George Washington Carver never had a birthday party? Nobody knew what his birthday was. Not the month, not the day, or the year. And nobody thought he lived to be past 18 years old. He had horrible medical issues. He almost died, for example, from whooping cough. His vocal cords would be scarred for the rest of his life. Carver, on top of all this, folks, struggled for an education. He went to the closest school. They wouldn't take him because he was a black boy. He was a Negro back then. So George Washington Carver reluctantly said goodbye to his former owners. He hit the road when he was 11 years old. He had five cents in his pocket and a sack lunch in his rock collection. He spent the next seven years going from town to town, hoping that town had a school hoping the teacher knew more than he did, hoping most of all that the school would take a black boy, which would be a problem. <clears throat> During his time, folks, George Washington Carver was frequently homeless. He was frequently penniless. He was frequently hungry. And he was frequently sick. But he would not quit. He was going to get a high school, high school diploma if it killed him. There were times, folks, when he ran out of money. When he earned some money, he used it to buy books that came first over food. And as you can imagine, he got to be really skinny. George Washington Carver, by the miracle of God, he graduated from high school, which was a very big deal back then for anybody. The average American in the Midwest was not a high school graduate. And then things got really exciting. George Washington Carver was accepted for admission to Highlands University. He was thrilled. 
He was just a walking everywhere. He spent his last nickel on his first train ride. He got to the school a day early, very excited, went to the registration office, announced himself, and the registrar said, there's some mistake. You're a Negro. And he rejected him. He withdrew his admission. Now, folks, I have seven programs about America. I'm hyper-patriotic. I served in the U.S. Air Force Reserve for 35 years. I'm hyper-hyper-patriotic, okay? But this is embarrassing. They rejected him. He said it was the saddest day of his life. It was the one time he wanted to cry. He was completely destroyed. George Washington Carver, he began what I call the five grim years, but he never forgot. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. For the next five years, he wandered the Midwest. For the first year, he made his money hand washing the clothes of the students who attended the university that rejected him. And after that, he did all kinds of odd jobs, had all kinds of adventures that we could talk about. During this time, Carver said his usual diet was cornmeal, beef fat, and prayer. And he says sometimes he had to stick to just, just a prayer. But folks, what amazes me, George Washington Carver never asked anybody for money unless he earned it. Now, I admit, folks, if I were starving and you offered me a couple of dollars for a cheeseburger, I'd take it. I'd try to pay you back, but I'd take the money and buy a cheeseburger. He would not do that. He had to earn everything. There was one major exception. Later on, he became famous. He was uh, 73 years old, having a really, really tough time of it. Henry Ford found out that George Washington Carver was having a terrible time getting up the 17 steps to his tiny apartment in Tuskegee. So Ford said, I want to build him an elevator. Carver immediately, by reflex, said, no, 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 that's okay. A couple days later, going up and down those stairs, he said, you know what? I'm getting really tired of these stairs, and Henry Ford is never going to miss the $2,000. So he said, Henry, I'll take your money for the stairs. I mean, for the elevator. That elevator is still working today at Tuskegee. Now, there's one thing Carver asked for a lot, and copiously, I might add. He loved advice. He had all kinds of white and black people who would advise him, good, solid Christian individuals. That reminds us of the verse, in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Whenever our young people are present, I tell them, you know what, you may not want to do it, but you know what, your parents might just know more than you do. So maybe you ought to listen to them. Carver did a whole lot of listening, and it paid off big time. He got a hot tip. There was a small college in Iowa called Simpson College. He found out that school would take him as a student. He was thrilled. He did very well. He was there for a year majoring in art and music. But everybody told him the same thing. You're not going to make any money in art and music, and you're never going to make a big, big difference. You need to go into science, which he loved almost as much as art and music. So he found out Iowa State Agricultural College, which is now Iowa State University, which is a very, very big school, they would take him. He went there, he got his bachelor's degree, his master's degree, and he offered him a professorship, even. In both schools, he was the only black student. He faced all kinds of challenges and adventures. If we have time during Q&A, I've got some really funny stories about his adventures. He excelled and became popular and respected. But let's get back to his character, shall we? There are three things that George Washington Carver despised. And these are, I think, lessons for us, at least for me, anyway. Number one, he had no use for bitterness. And if anybody had a right to be bitter, it was him. Big time. He thought bitterness was dumb. He said, well, somebody else said, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping it harms the other guy. <laughs> he thought carrying a grudge was dumb and time-consuming and exhausting. So, folks, there's nothing idealistic about this. He just didn't think bitterness was practical. Secondly, he had no use for excuses. He was known for being a very kind man. When he was a professor, he would frequently help students with their tuition. And they were shocked to find out no excuses when it came to test or homework assignments. He said, society will not give you any chance for excuses, and I won't either. 
Henry Ford loved that. Indeed, Carver said 99% of failures come from people who have the habit of making excuses. And then third, folks, he had no use for self-pity. Once again, not because he was idealistic, but because self-pity didn't put food on the table, folks. It just wasn't practical. I'm reminded of Helen Keller. As you might know, she went blind and deaf at a very young age. And she says, self-pity is our enemy, and if we yield to it, we can never do anything good in the world. In short, folks, Carver thought that self-pity, excuses, and bitterness were unscript uh, I'm sorry, unspiritual, unbiblical, unproductive, unhealthy, and useless. Now, folks, I've already got my hand up, okay? How many here have ever made excuses or felt bitter or exercise self-pity. We all have, right? <laughs> Carver said, no, nope, doesn't do you any good. Instead, he stressed three P's, starting with positivity. For example, God's Word tells us, for the joy of the Lord is my strength. A merry heart does do us good like a medicine, but a broken spirit writhe the bones. Carver believed in being positive no matter what. Secondly, he was huge on persistence. I don't know of any American who has faced as many challenges as George Washington Carver. But you know what his secret was? He just wouldn't quit. He just wouldn't stop. He was the Rocky Balboa, folks, of his time when it came to science. Calvin Coolidge was a huge fan of George Washington Carver. Coolidge said, nothing in this world can take the place of persistence. Persistence and determination alone are omnipotent. Folks, every time Carver came up against an obstacle, he would sigh, he would pray, he'd get back up, and he would just keep charging. One of his favorite verses, his second favorite, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high coming of God in Christ Jesus. And then third, folks, boy, was Washington George Washington Carver, big on prayer, and we'll get more to that in a minute. That brings us, folks, from his career and his character to his Christianity. Here we are at the George Washington Carver Museum, Museum at Tuskegee, Alabama, a wonderful place. This was his laboratory, so it's awesome to walk, you know, in the same places where he was walking, making his experiments and what have you. But folks, wow, I was completely unprepared for the National Monument outside Jotham, Missouri. Completely unprepared, folks. I uh, I thought I'd be here for an hour. I got there about noon, driving four hours from St. Louis. They had to kick me out at five o'clock, folks. And I still didn't get to see everything I wanted. Folks, in that museum, they pushes Christian faith hard. If the ACLU ever finds out about this place, <laughs> They show three different films there. All three films discuss this Christian faith. And the Rangers were very kind to me. They gave me all kinds of files. They gave me a list of all the quotations from Carver that they have posted there in the, the, the I'm sorry, Museum. Folks, 36 quotations from Carver are on display. Half of them, 17 of them, folks, deal with God, the Bible, Christ, creation, or Christianity. Indeed, folks, they have a wonderful nature walk behind the main museum. There are 18 stone markers with quotations from him. Half of them deal with God. And the very first one, folks, says, How can I be sure that I'm on the right road in all thy ways to acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths? Now you must learn to look to him for direction, and you then can follow, and you'll never go wrong. To be more specific, though, regarding his Christianity, George Wash Carver was big, big, big on prayer. At the monument, folks, they actually marked the spot where there used to be a barn in which George Washington Carver used to pray as a little boy. Carver prayed, 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 and did some. By the way, I don't want to chase a rabbit here, but this has been kind of um, bothering me a little bit. I recently got to be the Northwest Awana Scholarship Camp Speaker. And we had a wonderful time. They had 400 and some odd kids there. Great, great kids. Everything was wonderful. They asked me if I would do a special session in the morning for the Citation Award winners. 
Uh, we had, I think, 19 or 20 high school graduates just got out of uh, school. And I already had uh, a uh, curriculum, if you will, what I wanted to say each morning, but I handed out a survey first, anonymous survey. And the survey was basically, who are you? And I asked them 20 questions. And one of the questions was, I asked, now these are citational work, this is a cream of the crop of Awana, okay? The best of the best of the best, right? I asked them, how often do you pray? The average was three times a week. What's wrong with that picture? Half the kids had no idea what they were supposed to do with their lives. Half of them. And I told the kids, I said, you're not going to find out unless you pray, pray, pray. And after that, pray some more. So I completely changed my curriculum. We went right all the way back to basics. <laughs> We had an entire session on how to pray. Now, is that sad folks or what? I'm sorry. Better move on. Get in trouble here. Carver folks would get up every morning at 4 o'clock and he would pray for two hours. And his colleagues would say, What? You're wasting so much time praying. And Carver said, If I don't pray, I won't get as much done. For him, life was like a coin with two sides. One side, was prayer, the other side was work. By the way, first, or sorry, uh, the second George Bush, he said, pray as if all depends upon God, for it does, but work as if all depends upon us, for it does. But secondly, besides prayer, George Washington Carver was really big on the word of God, big time. And folks, at the National Monument, everywhere you look, his favorite Bible verses are posted for people to read. And by the way, speaking of Bibles, uh, in St. Louis, after my wife got out of the hospital, she wanted to go to the world-famous botanical gardens. I, who knew? I didn't know St. Louis had a gigantic botanical garden. And it's famous, though, for their giant bronze statue, George Washington Carver. I always wondered what he was holding in his right hand. His left hand is, of course, holding a flower. Folks, I found out what he's holding in that hand. He's holding a Bible. <laughs> George Washington Carver, even when he was homeless as a teenager trying to get an education, he would teach Sunday school in the closest church nearby. Even when he taught at Tuskegee uh, Institute, which became a university, on Sunday afternoons, he would have extremely popular Bible lessons. He would talk about either creation science or he would act out a Bible story, which became very popular. His number one most successful story, folks, was about Sodom and Gomorrah. Why was it so successful? Because the kids said it was the most realistic. George Washington Carver had some pyrotechnics that went wrong. He almost burned down the church. <laughs> Carver said, well, you can't beat it for authenticity. <laughs> And then, folks, there's this Christian testimony. Wow, was Carver not shy about this? Everywhere he went, he would say, Without my Savior, I am nothing. The YMCA picked him up as their number one top speaker. They sent him everywhere speaking in churches and schools and colleges, civic groups, and other events. He would talk about God and creation, penis and agriculture, black and white relations, and sometimes he covered all three in the same speech. He was hugely popular as a speaker about race relations, and one magazine said he has become probably the greatest single force for interracial goodwill. Boy, we could use him today, folks, big time. Carver was huge on the golden rule, and he would tell people, as ye would that men do, should do to you, you be also to them likewise. Now, of course, unfortunately, folks, this is a time of horrible <coughs> racism. Carver was almost murdered uh, outside of town in Alabama. But what's heartbreaking, folks, Carver faced almost as much resentment from blacks as from whites. The blacks were jealous of his popularity and envied his success. Moving on, last but not least, we turn to his creationism. Carver said he was a very eloquent man. He said, the world about us far more intricate than any watch 
Marvelous beyond even the imagination of the most skilled investigator, this beautiful and intricate creation bears the signature of its creator, Raven, in its works. By the way, folks, did you notice I underlined creation and creator? Those two words are based upon the word create. Have you ever thought about that? The word creature that we use all the time for our life is based upon a biblical word. Anyway, folks, at the National Monument, they have all kinds of statements about Carver's belief in creation by God. For example, here we read, George Washington Carver thought his work in science and his faith in God worked together. He believed true science always agreed with the Bible. Furthermore, we read, he believed that the great creator made the world, and by learning more about the world, people would learn more about the creator. George said, I do love the things God has created. And he wanted everyone to know, so he wrote and talked about it, etc., etc. Carver said, My lifetime study of nature in its many, oh, I misspelled many. <laughs> My lifetime study of nature in its many phases leads me to believe more strongly than ever in a biblical account of creation is found in Genesis 127, and God created man in his own image. But of course, with this background, Carver was especially fascinated by creation botany. He loved plants. He was amazed at how complicated a tiny little plant cell is, looking at it through his microscope. Many other people are amazed too. One of our evolutionary friends admitted, as yet, we've been unable to trace the phylogenetic history, the classification background, of a single group of plants from its beginning to the present. Folks, all we hear about is animal evolution. One reason we don't hear about plant evolution is there's nothing to prove plant evolution at all. Well, as far as plants are concerned, Carver, he really wasn't that big on peanuts. He loved flowers. And he believed everything about flowers, pointing to creation by God. This is his official portrait, folks, which hangs in the National Gallery in the Smithsonian. I was thrilled to finally get to see it in person. He's admiring his flowers there, and he said, Can any of you believe that the miracle of this flower is no more than an accident? Of all the flowers he loved, orchids were his favorite. Orchids are fascinating. 25,000 different orchids, folks, more than any other flower. And folks, furthermore, I call the orchid the alien plant. There is no plant on earth like the orchid. It's completely different from any other plant, period. My evolutionary friends, and we might have some here today, we're honored you're with us, they don't have a clue how the orchid evolved. That's because it didn't, folks. So much can be said about plants and orchids. He was amazed at their divine design. He was amazed at their photosynthesis. And he's amazed at symbiosis, which, as you might know, deals with the relationship between plants and animals, animals and animals, plants and plants. For right now, we're talking about the relationship between flowers, most flowers, and bees, bats, birds, and butterflies. For evolution, symbiosis is a horrible, horrible problem. It's tough enough for them to explain how flowers evolved. It's tough enough to explain how the bees, bats, birds, and butterflies evolved. How do you explain them evolving in, in, well, together at the same time, folks? You don't. It can't be done. But, folks, it gets even better. Orchids are experts at symbiosis. For example, the fly orchid. How did this orchid know to look like a fly, to attract flies, to cross pollinate? But, folks, the most famous of all symbiosis involving orchids is the bee orchid. How did this orchid know to look like a bee? And attract bees to cross pollinate. And you know, folks, if you want to see something really funny and heartbreaking at the same time, go on YouTube and watch their film of a bee desperately trying to get romantic with the bee orchid. <laughs> I mean, it's sad, folks. He's trying so hard to get romantic, and it's not working. But the orchid is getting cross pollinated, folks. How? Did an orchid known to look like that? He was created that way, wasn't he, folks? But then, ladies, it gets even better. We've got flowers that look like bugs. 
Here we have a bug that looks like a flower. The orchid mantis. That's a bug. The orchid mantis. Every single thing about him looks like a flower. How did he know to look like that? By the way, uh, I saw my first orchid mantis at the Victoria Bug Zoo. Has anybody been to the Victoria Bug Zoo? Oh, yeah, have you been there? Is that a great place? Or? You're the first person in a long time, man. Stand up, please, stand up. All right, this is a special lady. <laughs> <laughs> is that a great place or what? Yeah. It's fantastic, <laughs> and it's cheap. It's in Victoria, B.C., and it's walking distance from the ferry. Okay, so the next time you go to Victoria, folks, you've got to go there. They have all kinds of great big terrarium tanks full of all kinds of fascinating bugs. Now, I admit, my wife was not happy because my wife hates bugs, all right? But they've got all kinds of miracles of creation on display, and folks, they put an orchid mantis in the palm of my hand. So I would highly recommend you go. Now, I don't know if you did what I did. I was trying to show off in front of my wife. That was a bad thing to do. They asked if I wanted to hold a tarantula. I thought, oh, come on. How bad can that be? <laughs> they put a Goliath tarantula in my hands. It's bigger than a dinner plate. I thought I was going to have a heart attack. <laughs> my wife said, church, why does a sheet? There's this tarantula this big in my hands. And the tour guy starts petting the tarantula in my hands. And the tarantula staring at me, his little pedipulps are doing this. I'm going, ah. Oh. <laughs> and finally, the tour guy could see I was about ready to faint. So she took the glass tarantula. The other thing that didn't bother me that way, they put one of those black scorpions. By the way, black scorpions are really quite harmless unless you love them. All right? It's the little tiny white ones that are dangerous, which reminds us of the verse in the Bible. It's the little foxes that spoil the vine. It's the little scorpions that are trouble. But they put a big black scorpion six inches long on my hand, and he just walked up my hand. Of course, I'm looking at his finger bobbing up and down like this. So, Maybe they don't want to go now, huh? They won't make you hold any bugs, folks, but I was dumb enough to volunteer. What was your favorite bug? Do you remember? I don't remember, but I do remember getting chocolate-covered ants. <laughs> 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 anyway, Victoria Bugs here, folks. All right, tell them I sent you. They won't give you a discount, but tell them anyway. <laughs> Ladies, is that a pretty bug or what? How did he know to look like that? It didn't just happen, did it? That's not, a, that's not just chance, is it? And we can go on and on about some other fascinating plants and animals, folks. But we have to start wrapping things up. Some of you are thinking about making people go. <laughs> Carver said, nature in its varied forms are the little windows through which God permits me to see much of his glory, his majesty, power, and creation. Truly, folks, in Colossians 1.16 we read, For by him, the Lord Jesus Christ, were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible. We could go on and on and on, but we folks probably want to uh, get something to drink. We have to start closing here. Folks, perhaps you can see why I think he was our most inspirational American ever. But some of you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, boy, what about George Washington? Why isn't he your most inspirational American ever? Glad you asked. Folks, I call this life's ladder. George Washington Carver, I think spiritually, he got to the top of that ladder, don't you think? In terms of his accomplishments, he got almost all the way to the top. In terms of persistence, nobody beats George Washington Carver. He did not start out at the bottom of the ladder, folks. He started out 10 feet below the bottom of the ladder. Compared to George Washington, Washington, I love Washington, okay, great man, right? Washington had it easy. He was born into a fine family. He was rich. He married the richest widow in Virginia. He was tall, handsome, strong, athletic, healthy, and every single advantage you can think of, except for good teeth. And he was white. George Washington Carver had nothing. In fact, he had less than nothing. So ask me why I think Carver was the most inspirational American ever. Carver did pass away finally, the Vice President of the United States, 1943, said when Dr. Carver died, the U.S. lost one of its finest Christian gentlemen. We close with this, folks. This was a combination of poem and eulogy done by the famous journalist, Kurt Schlacht. K 
came out January 6, 1943, the day after Carver died. The end reads, on his death, January 5, 1943, America lost a noble son, the world a great benefactor, mankind a faithful scientist. Dr. Carver's life should be an inspiration to the youth of his race and to all Americans. He was one of God's noblemen. He was truly a great American. Give me the right place. I want to thank you for coming today. I hope that was worth your while. It looks like we got some time for two days. Any questions or comments we can address before we shove off? Is everything clear as mud? I'm getting off easy. Okay, let me tell you some stories. All right? Uh, I haven't told these stories in a long time, so I need to get them straight, okay? When he was at Simpson College, everybody was wealthy compared to him. In fact, he did not go to college back then unless he came from a wealthy family. Okay, there weren't that many scholarships, there were no government grants, okay, so if you went to college, you had to have books. Carver didn't have any books. So Carver was one of the only students who had to work. Well, four of his friends and a professor found out that Carver lived in a leaky shack on campus. While he was gone working, they got into a shack and found out he slept on a pile of straw on the dirt. And he had a makeshift desk. His furniture was all made out of fence boards that he was given by a farmer after he took care of a job. So his friends thought that was outrageous. So his friends came back, they took all his boards away, they took his straw away, and he put on, they put down a new bed with end tables and a table for him to eat at, and, ch and chairs and a chest of drawers and shelves for all of his rock specimens and all of his books. Carver comes back, now remember, Carver. He did not like charity. Remember that, okay? Carver comes back and he is stunned. He goes to the police station. He goes, I've been robbed. Somebody stole all my furniture. And what? Somebody stole your furniture? Goes, yes. And he went into all these details. And the cop says, Are you kidding me? Get out of here. <laughs> Second story. Uh, still with Simpson College. Carver was, was uh, quite the painter and a uh, very famous uh, flower painting made uh, was, it, it, it won all these awards and it was selected for submission at the World's Fair. That's a big, big deal. College was very excited about this. Well, the painter was supposed to accompany his painting to the World's Fair. And they were all embarrassed to find out that Carver had no nice clothes at all. He was the shabbiest dressed person on campus. Well, they couldn't have that. He represented their school. So they tried to give him money to go and get a suit. No, 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 I'm not taking your money. This is probably the illegal day. That professor and his four friends, they bodily kidnapped him and they dragged him kicking and screaming to the town tailor. The town tailor said, young man, stop struggling. I'm going to make you a suit whether you like it or not because the suit has already been paid for. If you want the suit to fit correctly, you better stop being so difficult. <laughs> so he finally resigned himself, and uh, he got a suit and a hat and an overcoat, a couple shirts, a couple ties, a pair of shoes, and stuff. You get to pick up the room. And that's what he wore to the World's Fair, accompanying his painting. Now remember, he's a very frugal person, okay? George Washington Carver wore that suit for the next 50 years. <laughs> By the time he died, there were more patches in the word original clothing on that suit. That's how frugal this guy was. So folks, when you, when you read about Carver, like this book here, I always tell people, when you read this book, you better have a hanky handy. Okay? This guy went through so much. And you can never feel sorry for yourself again. Or feel bitter again after reading about George Washington Carver. If you think you've got problems, with all due respect, you probably didn't have his problems. <laughs> okay, pardon me. Anybody? Question, comment? Going once. Going twice. <laughs> going three times. Okay, well, I guess we will break and, and have time to drink coffee or whatever. Shall we close in prayer? That'd be great. Okay, let's pray. Our God, we just thank you for people like George Washington Carver. We thank you for what he has done for so many people, spiritually, scientifically. We thank you, Father, that we can learn from him spiritually and practically. 
And we pray that we'll remember some of his life's lessons based upon your word and his life. We thank you for this church and for its testimony. We pray for it in